if there are any questions, inshallah, we can take them. Or comments, it doesn't even need to be a question. Yeah, it was kind of interesting that the angels include all the children of the believers, because that kind of sounds like it could be just all the children of, children of Adam, so all of humanity. That's that's why they, they said, وَمَنْ صَلَحَ وَمَنْ صَلَحَ means, you know, those who have goodness in them. That the, There are certain prerequisites that have to be met. Not just everybody. وَمَنْ صَلَحَ those who are, who are salihin from among their uh, their parents, their spouses. Some of the mufassirin have said, وَمَنْ صَلَحْ means if there is any good in them, that, that if they have they've made an attempt to draw closer to Allah, but they have shortcomings, they have sins. وَمَنْ صَلَحَ مِنْ آبَائِهِمْ So this is why they mention وَمَنْ صَلَحَ If they didn't mention Waman Salah, then it would encompass everybody. Yeah, I just it's kind of like goes along the lines like, hey, you don't necessarily have to be Muslim or to have angels praying for you in this case or have forgiveness. Not necessarily, because because again, there are many people who who were never exposed to the true Islam. You know how many people around the world were actually exposed to the Islam of Ahlul Bayt. Now, I'm not talking about the Islam of other schools, the pure, unadulterated Islam of Ahlul Bayt. Many people have not. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely have mercy upon these people who are essentially victims. You know, every human being, and this I, I do this every once in a while, when you walk around and you see people are completely lost, I look at people who are lost today as victims of the Saqifa. You know, what happened after the death of the Prophet, you know, pushing Amir al-Mu'mineen to the side and usurping his right to lead the Ummah. Believe me, all of the people that I see around the world today, the, the suffering, the devastation, the confusion, all of it, I see humanity, they're all victims. They're all victims of the crime of that meeting that took place after the death of the Prophet. So if people have goodness in their hearts and they did not knowingly reject the truth, see, this is where the problem is, because kufr is to conceal the truth, to reject it after it, after it has become clear to you. There's an element of rebelliousness and arrogance with kufr. You know, many of the people that you see today, believe me, they're they're walin, they're lost. Oh, thanks, and um, thank you. And there's one question that someone asked online. Yes. If we talk about believing in idols, we always refer to something physical, such as specific sculptures and the way people worship them in history. I wonder if the form of idols can be changed, uh, can change as the time passes and our tools and inter interests change. For example, we're living in an era where technology is having a significant impact on our lives. Do we need to be worried about aspects of technology that could play a role which idols have played in the past? <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, even the Quran mentions, Have you seen the one who has taken his carnal desires? as his Lord. Anything that you become obsessed with and it becomes this, the, 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 the focal point of your attention can be considered an idol. So it doesn't have to be a physical idol. It could be your ego, your desires, or any system, any man-made system that you have so much faith in that it makes you turn away from the, the system of living that has been introduced by the Sharia. So for example, if someone is an, is an ardent believer in an interest-based economy, this could be one of your idols, that you believe that the only way to achieve economic pros prosperity in the world is to follow and embrace this ultra-capitalistic, interest-based system. 
that this becomes your idol this becomes the only way for us to achieve prosperity so really anything that shifts someone someone's focus away from God and from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed could be a, a an idol if you weren't meant to get everything we want to in this life, what is the point of making dua? If we're not meant, let me, so you're saying if we're not meant to get everything that we desire, what's the point of making dua? Yeah. Now again, dua, one of the functions of dua is that you know number one we supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for many reasons we don't only supplicate to him to ask him for things we supplicate to him for him to pardon us we supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our capacity to receive his uh, his blessings and his gifts now you have to also bear in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this earthly life the primary objective in this life is for us to develop our souls to such an extent that we can experience paradise so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know when you pray to him when you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes withholds things from you because it's detrimental to your spiritual development. But again, you don't know what is good for your spiritual development and what is what is harmful. So you ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to give you things that will benefit you. You ask Allah Azza wa Jalla to grant you health, to increase your rizq, because that's what you think may bring you closer to Him. But He's the only one who knows what's actually going to bring you closer to Him. So just because you're not going to be given everything that you want, it doesn't negate the purpose of du'a. Because again, the, 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 the purpose of this life is for us to know God, to get closer to Him, to purify the soul, so we can experience paradise. It's, it's, the example that I usually give people is that in the same way that you cannot give honey to a newborn because their digestive system is not developed yet, Allah cannot give us Jannah without putting us through the trial of dunya because our soul is not developed yet to experience that type of intense pleasure. Do you see what I mean? Um, when there were more than 360 idols in Kaaba, uh, why again and again in Quran, uh, these three or four items are mentioned, like Dalat, Manat, Uta, and Kul, are they their great gods or something? Now, now, when you look at the idols, it seems that from what I have read from historical accounts and something that's mentioned even in the Tafasir is that each god seemed to be responsible for a certain aspect of their lives. So for example, you have the god of rain, the god of, uh, of wind, the god of fertility, the god of war, the god of peace. Now, of course, not all of these these gods are at the same the same level. Some are more prominent than others, but it seems that, for example, the uh, one of the idols that I mentioned, and I believe it was uh, perhaps it was Manat. Manat was seen as the the god of destiny. So, because destiny and the future was very important to the Arabs. They probably attach more importance to that specific idol. So each idol represented a deity that had control over a certain part of nature, a certain part of human life. So these idols, 
became prominent because perhaps of their connection to a certain aspect of human life that the Arabs felt was very significant. And it also could be that when you have more people from a certain tribe worshiping an idol, naturally that idol is going to be more popular. So for example, uh, Al-Uzza, which was worshipped by uh, Quraysh, and Quraysh is a very huge tribe, they're very influential, so naturally the idol that they worship, that they have close to them, is going to be more prominent than other idols. And typically the Arabs would kind of, you know, they would feel more of an affiliation to certain idols than others. It could also be uh, just, it would have to do with location. For example, when I, when I mentioned to you guys uh, Alat, Alat was, a, was an idol that was situated in Ta'if. It was an actual idol. They built a shrine for it in Ta'if. So the people who lived in Ta'if, they're going to feel a stronger connection to that idol. So it's not that other idols were insignificant. These idols, because of their locations in certain cities, important cities, like, you know, you have Yathrib, Mecca, Ba'if, more people lived in these regions. So there's naturally going to be more emphasis and more focus on these idols. Whereas other, other tribes, they, they may have lived further and they housed their idols in the Kaaba. They probably see their idols you know, once every few months, whereas the these three idols were much more accessible because they were actually located uh, in these places and the people that worshipped them lived there. And it's uh, Manamat, uh, the third most important idol, uh, Sheikh, because uh, uh, it's at Manata, Tarifat al -Ukhram. Yeah, Man Manat, Sheikh Nasr Makarim al-Shirazi says that Manat was actually the first one of, or at least one of the first idols that was introduced to the Arabs. Third, and Manat the third in Ayat 20. Yeah, well, Manat the third. Your question is why is it a third? Is it the third most, you know, great idol or something? No, 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 no. I, I see what you're saying. When, when, when the ayah says, وَمَنَاتَ al الْأُخْرَى Thalitha, Allah is not talking about the, the order of their importance. The, the order of, uh, of, these, uh, of the mentioning of the idols, Allah is not talking, is not saying that Lat is more important than, than Uzza and then the third most significant is Manat. It's not talking about the, uh, there's no hierarchy there. Okay. So it's just the number, number three. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's the, the third, the third that is, that is very well known. Thank you.